Chapter 9, Head and Neck Anatomy. The study of head and neck anatomy provides the dental system with the anatomical basis for the clinical practice of dental assisting. We we'll learn about the muscles and the lymph nodes in the neck, the bones of the skull and face, and the salivary glands. We will also learn about the muscles that create your facial expressions and those that help you open and close your mouth and swallow your food. So the regions of the head, the head is divided into regions, the frontal, the parietal, the occipital, temporal, orbital, nasal, infraorbital, zygomatic, buccal, oral, and mental. And the mental region is not mental as in like the head, it's mental as in your chin or the chin area. So the bones of the skull, the bones of the skull, the human skull is divided into two sections. The cranium, which is composed of eight bones that cover and protect the brain and the face, the face, which consists of 14 bones. The bones of the cranium are single, which are the frontal, the occipital, the sphenoid, the ethmoid, and then there's paired bones, which are the parietal and temporal. This is the lateral view of the skull. So lateral means the side view. The frontal view of the skull. The posterior view of the skull, which is the back of the head. The view of the external base of the skull. So this would be like if you're looking at the skull as if it were if, as if the body was laying down. This is the whole of where the um, the spine the spine goes through the spinal cord. So bones of the face, the bones visible on the interior view of the skull include the following, the lacrimal bone, the nasal bone. Okay, the nasal bone is the bone of the nose. Lacrimal is the, the, um, the bone where, kind of like where your tears come out of. Zygomatic bone, inferior nasal conch, the vomer, the maxilla, which is the maxillary um, jaw, and then the mandible, which is the bottom jaw. Bones and landmarks of the hard palate. So there's an incisive foramen. The medial plate of palatine, palatine formula. And behind and above, from behind meaning as if you were looking at it from the inside of the mouth of the patient looking. The mandible from the left and front. And the mandible from internal left, which is. One is unique because it does not split with any other bone between the mandible and the larynx. It, it functions as the primary support for the tongue. It's shaped like a horseshoe and consists of a central body with two left The position is, is noted in the process of the temporal bone by two stylohyoid ligaments. Oh, 
bolt is large and the cranial base and face are, are, are small. The face will dimension because of the teeth. teeth have, have, have not, not yet, yet erupted. Fusion which is the maxillary jaw, which is at the, we said that max means at the top. At birth, the maxilla is entirely filled with developing tooth buds. Vertical growth of the upper face is caused largely by dental alveolar development and formation of the maxillary sinuses. So the difference between the differences between male and female skulls tend to be smaller and lighter and to have thinner walls. The female forehead usually retains a round anterior contour and the teeth are smaller with rounded incisal edges. Male skulls are larger and heavier and have more rugged muscle markings prominently. Male teeth are larger and more squared incisally and the forehead is flatter as a result of developing frontal sinuses which are larger in men. So usually this is how you can um, sometimes tell if let's say it, there's been a body that's been missing for a long time and then they find the remains usually this is how they can tell if the, the remains are male or female the fetal skull anterior view so the anterior fontanelle the frontal eminence interfrontal met metopic suture is this line here and the symphysis venti which is the bottom part of the jaw that says that it's, it's um it develops um, in two pieces and then it fuses as the child gets older. And this is the lateral view, which is the sideways view. The coronal suture, the, sphen the sphenoidal suture, the lymphoidal suture, and the mastoid fontanelle. The fetal skull on the posterior view, uh, parietal eminence, the lymphoidal suture, the sagittal suture, the ossifying posterior fontanelle. The stages of postnatal development of the human skull. So this is at birth, three years, six years, as an adult and as an aged adult. And this is the lateral view of each. And notice here how the, the, like the sutures, the fusion of the parts of the cranium are more prominent in babies because they're not used yet. Um, and then when you start seeing it here, they're almost disappeared. You can still see the little lines, the sutures, but not as much as you can when the baby at birth. OK, so temporal mandibular joints, OK, the TMJ, which is also the temporal mandibular joint, so you'll hear TMJ a lot, is a joint on each side of the head that allows for movement of the mandible for speech and mastication chewing. It takes its name from the two bones that enter it into its formation, the temporal bone and the mandible bone. The temporal mandibular joints, or the bony parts of the TMJ, are the glenoid fossa, the articular eminence, and the condyloid process. Capsular ligament. A fibrous joint capsule completely encloses the TMJ. The capsule wraps around the margin of the temporal bone's articular eminence and articular fossa superiorly. Inferiorly, the capsule wraps around the circumference of the mandibular condyle, including the condyle neck. Articular space. The area between the capsular ligament and the surfaces of the glenoid fossa and condyle, articular disc 
also called a meniscus, is a cushion of dense specialized connective tissue that divides the articular space into upper and lower compartments. These compartments are filled with synovial fluid, which helps lubricate the joint and fills the synovial cavities. This is the lateral view of the temporal mandibular joint. So this is where um, the, this is the joint capsule. So this is where the mandible, the lower jaw, okay, um, articulates with the temporal mandibular ligament. Jaw movement of the TMJ. So hinge action. The first phase of mouth opening, only the lower compartment of the joint is used. Now gliding movement, it allows the lower jaw to move forward or backward. It involves both the lower and upper compartments of the joint. The condyle and articular disc glide forward and downward along the articular eminence. So gliding movement. Protrusion is the forward movement of the mandible. So if you, you practice right now, you can see that you can actually move your mandible forward. The reversal of this movement is the backward movement of the mandible called retrusion. Lateral movement of the mandible occurs when the internal and external pterygoid muscles on the same side of the face contract together. And lateral means side to side. Hinge and gliding actions of the TMJ. So this is just um, at rest, opening, which is um, up and down, and then gliding which could sometimes be um, forward and backwards. Temporal mandibular disorders, and sometimes you get a lot of patients um, that experience problems with their TMJ and they will let you know. Um, a patient may experience a disease process associated with one or both of the TMJs called a temporal mandibular disorder, or also known as TMD. TMD is complex, involving such factors as stress, clenching, which clenching means holding teeth tightly together for prolonged periods. And sometimes this is um, uh, like involuntary. You don't, it's subconscious. You don't know that you're doing it. And then bruxism, which is, is actual grinding of the teeth, especially at night. This is why some people will need to get a mouth guard specially made for them because they grind their teeth um, at night when they're sleeping. And it's something that they do subconsciously. They're not doing it on purpose. But when there's a person that has really bad uh, bruxism or grinding of the teeth, you you will see that, especially if they've been doing it for long periods of time, because you'll see that their teeth will start to get like flattened out. They have kind of grinded um a lot of the um like a lot of the oh my god I forgot the word a lot of the anatomy of the teeth, how the teeth have um like bumped and ridges. A lot of that will be worn down. Sometimes you'll hear that in little kids too, the bruxism, and they say that it's because of stress. Um, but it's more, it's you'll see it or hear it a lot more in adults. TMD can also be caused by trauma to the jaw. Systemic diseases such as osteoarthritis or wear due to aging. The palpation of the patient during movement of both TMJs. So symptoms of TMJ disorder, pain, the patients with TMD may report a wide range of pain types, joint sounds, um, clicking, popping, or crepitus may be heard when the mouth is open. Crepitus is the cracking sound that may be heard in a joint. Limitations of movement, trismus, a spasm of the muscles of mastication is the most common cause of restricted mandibular movement. Sometimes you'll hear that they can't open their mouth very wide for the doctor to look in there or they can't open their mouth very wide for you to take x-rays. Causes of TMJ disorder. TMDs are often considered to be related to stress. Oral habits such as clenching the teeth or bruxism are important contributing factors. Other causes of TMDs include accidents involving injury to the jaw, head, or neck, diseases of the joint including several varieties of arthritis, or malocclusion in which the teeth come together in a manner that produces abnormal strain on the joint and surrounding tissues. The muscles of the head and neck. 
To perform a thorough patient examination, it is necessary to know the location and action of many muscles of the head and neck. Malfunctions of muscles may be involved in malocclusions, improper bites, TMJ disorder, and even the spread of dental infections. The muscles of the head, of the head and neck. Seven main groups of muscles include muscles of the neck, muscles of facial expression, muscles of mastication, muscles of the tongue, muscles of the soft palate, muscles of the floor of the mouth, and muscles of the pharynx. So let's talk about the major muscles of the neck. The two muscles of the neck are both superficial, superficial and easily palpated, and palpated means that they can be touched um, or palp palpated with your fingers. The sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. These muscles can become painful when dental assistants use improper posture while assisting. And this is the palpation of the sternocleidomastoid uh, muscle. And clearly you can see it because they're very superficial. Major muscles of facial expression. The orbicularis oris closes and puckers the lips. The buccinator compresses the cheeks against the teeth and retracts the angle of the mouth. The mentalis erases and wrinkles the skin of the chin and pushes the lower lip up as like when you speak. Zygomatic major, it draws the angles of the mouth upward and backward as in laughing. Major muscles of mastication, there's the temporal, the masseter, internal or medial pterygoid, external lateral pterygoid. Major muscles of mastication, the temporalis, obviously on the temple, the masseter, which is on the cheek, zygomatic major, orbicularis oris, the buccinator, and the mentalis. The muscles of the floor of the mouth, the zygastric, the mylohyoid, silohyoid, and the geniohyoid. This is the view from the above, from above the floor of the oral cavity. So the higher point, the bone, the mylohyoid muscle, the geniohyoid muscle, the inner surface of the mandible, which is right behind your teeth, and the genial tubercles. Muscles of the tongue. Intrinsic, which means in, within the tongue, are responsible for shaping the tongue during speech, chewing, and swallowing. And then extrinsic, which means on the ex on extern external, assist in the movement and the function of the tongue. So the intrinsic muscles, which are inside of the tongue, are the genial glosses, depresses and protrudes the tongue, protrudes the tongue, the hyoglossus, which retracts and pulls down the side of the tongue, the styloglossus, which retracts the tongue, and the palatoglossus, which elevates the tongue and pulls it slightly backward. Muscles of the soft palate, the palatoglossus and the palatopharyngeus. And the soft palate is, if you put your tongue on the roof of your mouth, on your palate, the further back you go, then that's when you'll feel the muscles of the soft palate. When you don't feel that hardness anymore, like if there's a bone there, that's your soft palate. And it's all the way in the back, almost by your uvula. And the uvula is um, the dangling thing in the back of the throat. Salivary glands. Salivary glands produce saliva, which lubricates and cleanses the oral cavity and aids in the digestion of food through an enzymatic, enzymatic process. Saliva also helps maintain the integrity of tooth surfaces through a process of remineralization. Salivary glands are classified by their size as either major or minor. So there's the parotid salivary gland. And actually, when you are working on a patient and you're working on teeth up here somewhere, like on tooth number two, number three, and you're retracting the muscle, sometimes you will see like this tiny little hole on the inside of the cheek and uh, saliva will uh, drip out through there. Sometimes you'll see it um, um, like drops by drops. So sometimes that's why it's good to have like cotton rolls in this area and stuff to soak up any saliva that comes out of the, para the parotid salivary gland. 
And then there's a whole bunch of sublingual ducts, okay, um, which are under the tongue, and then the sublingual caruncle, which is right here under the lingual frenum. And when you're working on a patient and the patient has their tongue up like that, or like they've retracted their tongue on their own backwards, you'll see a, a saliva shoots out of these two little holes right here. Um, and sometimes it'll shoot pretty far, like a, like a tiny little water gun. So you gotta be careful with that. Two types of saliva. There's the serous, which is watery and it's mainly protein. And then there's mucus, which is very thick and mainly carbohydrate. Okay, so the minor salivary glands, they're smaller and more numerous than the major salivary glands. They're scattered in the tissues of the buccal, labial, and lingual mucosa, the soft palate, the lateral portions of the hard palate, and the floor of the mouth. Ebner's salivary gland is associated with the large circumvallate papillae on the tongue. Major salivary glands. The parotid salivary gland, where saliva passes from the parotid gland into the mouth through a, a duct called the parotid duct, also known as Stenson's duct. And this is the one that I showed you that's um, up by tooth, like number two, number three in that area, number uh, 15, number 14, when you're working on the upper. Submandibular salivary gland releases saliva into the oral cavity through Wharton's duct, which ends in the sub sublingual caruncles. It's right under the tongue. And then sublingual salivary gland. It releases saliva into the oral cavity through the sublingual duct, also known as Bartholin's duct. Okay, disorders of the salivary glands. So, xerostomia is also known as dry mouth, and it can result in an increase in dental decay and problems in speech and chewing. So, you will come across patients that have this dry, they say they suffer from dry mouth and the dentist might prescribe them with a, a special mouth rinse. Um, they also sell those um, over the counter. I've seen them in like the whole toothpaste, um, mouthwash areas of supermarkets. Um, what happens with when you have dry mouth is like saliva, it's your natural uh, lubricant of the mouth. And um, what happens is after you eat, if you don't brush your teeth, the saliva, which sometimes can be, a, it can be a little bit acidic, what it does is um, it kind of washes your mouth out and from bacteria so that whatever you ate, sugar or anything like that, doesn't stay too much on your teeth because that's what's going to cause decay. However, if you have dry mouth, that means that you don't pr produce enough saliva. So then the whole point of the saliva kind of doesn't exist in that type of person. And what happens is there's no saliva, there's no acidity to kind of wash off um, the sugars or whatever you eat and then that stays on your teeth and that's how you be, uh, get decay uh, faster than a, a person who does not have dry mouth would have. Um, also, that also happens when, um, when you sleep. When you sleep, you have saliva in your mouth. It keeps your mouth moisturized and if you, for whatever reason, didn't brush your teeth that night, it can, your, the saliva can kind of help you uh, have a less of a chance of getting decay. But if you have dry mouth, that doesn't really happen. Okay, so, and there's something also called salivary stones, which are sialoliths, okay, and they may block duct openings, preventing saliva from flowing into the mouth. And this is what a sialolith will look like um, in an x ray. And remember, anything that is like bone, metal, silver fillings, and stuff like that will show up kind of whitish on, on an x-ray. And then this is a picture of the sialolith in a minor salivary gland. So under the tongue, this is a, a, like, it's like a stone basically, and it's um, blocking the salivary duct. Okay, so I'm gonna stop right here, and then I'm gonna finish lesson of chapter nine tomorrow because this is a very long lesson.